Welcome to Showdown, a brand new series where I bring together a panel of reviewers to talk about a show that we've all seen. In this episode, I bring together Mark Shenton, Miriam Philpott and Daz Gale to talk about Brooklyn the Musical. Has anyone ever read you a fairy tale? <laughs> Every knife needs a little bit of magic, right? Once upon a time, has never felt more Welcome and welcome to the first episode of Showdown. Pleasure Indeed. to have you all here. When are you going to push, tell us when you're going to push record, yes? Makeup, hair. <laughs> Lights, camera, action. Here we go. Okay, so we're going, okay. So I'll just quickly introduce us all, um, based on your Twitter bios, why not? <laughs> um, we've got Mark Shenton, full-time freelance theatre critic for nearly 20 years full-time and a tutor at Arts Ed for 10, living and working in London for 35. Incredible. Yes, good. Um, over there, we've got Miriam Philpott, author and critic with your own blog, Cultural Capital, since 2013. Regularly reviews for the Reviews Hub. And then we've got Daz Gale, the new kid on the blog, the blogger behind all the dazzles, which will be celebrating its first birthday next week. So well, time flies, doesn't it? What a year it's been, hey? Oh, what what a year! Weird, but important, I guess. Yeah. So you were just saying to us before we started about starting a blog during a pandemic. I mean, what a crazy thing to do! But in some respects, it hasn't been because we've seen this this complete revolution of online theatre now. And it's been nice to document the change. I mean, when I started the website, I didn't, I had nothing to write about. There was no online theatre back then. It was that like in-between stage. Theatres were closed. We just were starting to get the shows must go on. So we were like getting every, all the Andrew Lloyd Webber shows every week. But then, then you've got the first virtual production. I think it was like, you know, when you've got stuff like the last five years, there's like, oh, that's, that's quite a good medium. And then how it's grown in, you know, what, about nine, ten months since the first one. It's crazy. And it's it, like I was just saying, I want it to stay. I don't want online theatre to disappear because it's a great little medium you know those nights when you don't when you want to see theatre but you don't actually want to leave the house which I'm sure will all happen in the future at some point um once you've once you've we've exhausted the hundred shows once we come when things are back it'd be nice just to sit there what's what's online oh let's watch this one exactly I'm not convinced because I I go to the theatre between seven and twelve times a week in normal times mm. so I never run out of things to see um and I think that online theatre is a pale imitation of the real thing. Yes, it's, it allows more accessibility. Yes, the people around the world can see it. And yes, I have enjoyed some stuff. But when I know what the real thing is like, it's, it's nothing like. Um, it's, it's just a pale, pale imitation. Um, and I'd rather go out of the theatre myself. Obviously, I don't want to go out if it's unsafe. So in the, in the circumstances right now, this is fine. But um, don't, don't, I don't want this to become the future. This, this, this is not what theatre is about. Theatre isn't on a screen. It's not on a laptop. Theatre is in person in a theatre building. Okay. And Miriam, what, do you, what are your thoughts about the transition between online and re returning to theatre? I think there's a happy balance between the two, actually. Um, 
you know, theatres have limited capacity even when they're working fully and in a full run. So if people internationally can watch a performance and theatres can diversify their income stream to protect them from situations like this, then digital offers an opportunity to do that. I don't deny that at all, that absolutely, the digital reach is enormous. I mean, when you think of, um, I, I, earlier today, I was talking to Clint Dyer, where they put Death of England, the uh, play that was closed at the National, um, obviously the night, in fact, they didn't have their press night. The press was snuck in the night early because that was going to be the last performance on yeah. middle, mid, mid December when the theatre shut down. Um, and by putting it online, they, they reached 85,000 people, which is much more than we've seen it in the Olivier Theatre, obviously. Um, um, but frankly, the audience, and yes, the National, of course, have first-class filming facilities and were able to film it in a way, in a really creative way, but it's still not the theatre experience. You're still not, you're still getting a slightly, a very different version to what uh, an audience member in the theatre would have seen. I think the accessibility uh, issue is important. Obviously, it's the age-old issue, you know, to make theatre accessible. It needs to be profitable, obviously, but not everyone can afford the tickets, even if you can get cheap ones, you know, shows that might sell out as well, or shows that are just, you know, 100, 150 pounds per pop. Also, people that can't actually get to the theatre. So if it's all going on in London and, you know, they're living somewhere nowhere near a theatre, you know, you've got this online option. I'm not saying to film everything, but it'd be nice to kind of go alongside it you can never have too much theatre so obviously we want every venue in the west end to still be full and giving us are giving us these amazing shows but there's no harm in keeping this filmed option as well just to go alongside it the more theatre the better i wonder though if it's going to cannibalize the theatre in the end because what i what can happen is that maybe people will just get lazy and will stay at home and nobody nobody will go into the theatres anymore and um, that that's the worst case scenario and especially if it is cheaper if it's a cheaper option and you don't have to leave your house People might favour that. That is a concern. That is a worry. What is it specifically, Mark, that you find is not relating by watching it on screen? Well, you're, you're just not, you're, you're literally not in the room where it happens. I mean, it's as simple as that. Theatre is all about the live experience. That's its essence. The essence is it's live. <laughs> if you're watching it on film, which especially if it's been pre-captured, um, as many of the Lambert Jackson shows are, they, they, they're pre-captured, then, then you're not in the room where, you're not even in the, in the same ether when it's happening. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like a film, it's stuck in, on, on, on tape. Um, and that's not a theatre experience. Theatre is all about the immediacy and the here and now. Now that's not to say that, that uh, you know, for instance, they, they filmed Hamilton um, uh, bef before the original cast. Now these days, it's not possible to see the original cast because the original cast has long gone and gone, gone into other things. When, when uh, the Netflix film that's available to watch it online is fantastic because you were able to watch the, on, the original cast. That's an archive experience mm -hmm. that's just not available anymore. So that's, that's different. That's, that's where it becomes a historical record. Um, but if the show is still running in, 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 you know, at right now, then there's no contest for me. I'm going to go to see the, the live performance if I, you know, if I can. And obviously, if I can't, you know, I'm living in, in London right now, and of course, we can't get to New York at the moment. Um, we're not allowed; the, the passage is shut. But the live from the Met, for example, you know, you'll, you you can go and watch a performance at the Metropolitan Opera if and when it returns, um, which is brilliant. I mean, that, 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 there there is definitely a, a side to this that that is good, but ultimately, it's not it's not what 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 I devoted my life to going to the theatre for. I mean, I agree with you to to, you know, to a, a real extent. You know, we I've I've really embraced online theatre this last twelve months because it's been all we've had. There's been those couple of reprises where we've got to go in. You know, like August open air theatre that one week in December where I got to see Les Mis and the Pound Town and it all shut again. You know, and yeah, nothing does compare. I'm just I'm just so thankful to have this, and I'm, I'm kind of liking it to maybe going. You know, going to see a movie. It's weird. I love going to the cinema. I don't actually miss the cinema too much. That's quite strange, mainly because I hate people talking behind me. But, you know, like, so all the films that have been premiering on Disney Plus and stuff haven't really lost anything by watching it. So I am wondering, yes, when theatres are open, I will be there every night. You know, I, all my money will go into it. But then, you know, if there are online things, I will embrace them. I mean, stuff like Brooklyn, which we're talking about, you know, that was, for me, one of the pinnacles of the last year of online theatre because it really showed what people could do and how far they've come since the last five years. And yeah, of course, it's not quite the same. You're never gonna completely recapture the magic. 
but it's something new and it's different and it'll be interesting when you've got both together you know real theater and online how it does stack up but I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot I think we're in a really privileged position because we go to the theatre all the time. We live very close to them. It's very available to us, but for a lot of people it isn't and they're intimidated by even the buildings. So if there is a way to open theatre up and to create experiences for people that will then encourage them to go and see live theatre in the future, then that's certainly something we should be looking to. Absolutely, absolutely. I was just going to say that, I just add though, that uh, as proper what you just said um, about the, that's about the uh, the cinema that, that, you know, now watching on TV. I mean, there's a real problem. There's a real worry that maybe people will not go back to cinemas because they've got into another habit now, yeah. which is that they, they, they've learned how to watch films at home and they don't feel they don't need to go back to the cinema. But I just watched a couple of weeks ago, um, a advanced um, a preview of In, In the Heights, um, the movie version of the Lin-Man Miranda movie. Um, and I was watching it on, you know, we've got a very large TV, one of those flat screen large ones on the wall. Um, but I was just wishing and longing to see it on a big screen. Um, it, it, oh. Even there, you see, it's, it's not just because I'm a theatre snob, it's I'm, I'm an experienced snob. I want things in there in full Technicolor. I want things on a big screen, on a big stage. I don't want things on a little, on a screen. I can't, I'll never watch a film on a, on a, on a mobile. I'll never watch, uh, I don't try not to watch things on a laptop. But yeah, I mean, I, I, of course, I've had a lot of joy out of watching things on TV, but, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up going to the cinema because there's a, a, I can watch it on TV. I'm not going to give up watching th live theatre because I can watch it on, t on, on at home. I mean, I get your point as well, um, that 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 um, Marianne, that we um, we are lucky, and and yes, it is it is privileged speaking that means that we're able to do this. But um, I read a wonderful thing. There's a 75 year old man who was interviewed in the in the, in the New York Times a few weeks ago. Um, who's been going to theatre for a lifetime. Um, and he just, he, he, he said, I don't do computer theatre. Yeah, that was his words, I just don't do it. Um, so it's not the same. So within In the Heights, was there anything you felt that was enhanced or improved upon? I'm not allowed to say yet. It's all right. under embargo. <laughs> I, I'm not allowed to, I'm not, I'm not, I, I just <laughs> sign my life away, but, we, but, but if, I will not comment on it publicly. Of course. Um, so if we, if we move on and we, we talk about Brooklyn, which we've all seen this week um, specifically, I mean, the benefit of that being captured as a film, because obviously the story does transition between countries and different, and there was an element, somebody described it as kind of, being an enhanced by the film because it, it made more sense. It was a clearer story by the way they told it. I mean, frankly, I saw the original on Broadway in 2004. It's a pretty terrible show. I yeah. saw the one, the, the revival at, at Greenwich when, when Greenwich did it in 2019. It was a terrible show. Yeah. It's not a good musical. So, so let's, let, let's, let, let's, let's start with that. It's actually a, it's actually a rubbish show. So, I've heard a lot of bad things about it. So this is my first experience of it. Right. So, but but actually, and here's the thing: I thought that watching it on 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 the video was actually excellent because they did a really good job of it, and it somehow the, the dramatic incongruities and the uh, it, it was just you know you, you kind of ignored all that and you just all you watched was some quite brilliant cinematography, yeah. really great set, brilliant performances. You know, it, it kind of sold itself because it was on TV, because it was on your laptop. So in this instance, where we've, we've taken a show that didn't work at, on a stage, they've actually managed to kind of make it work for this. So is that not a benefit? Do you think they've, they've improved upon it, if anything? Well, certainly Lambert Jackson have actually, they seem to have actually speci specialised in taking pretty terrible shows up for the most part. I mean, I love you, Your Perfect Now Change and First Dates are pretty negligible musicals yeah. in Brooklyn. Uh, all three of them are not great shows and they've made them actually work better as films than they were as stage shows. Um, yeah. On the other hand, they did Last Five Years, which I think is an exquisite musical. Uh, and, uh, and of course, Songs for New World, which they did on the stage um, at first and they, that's where they filmed it as well. Um, but uh, they, they, they've, they definitely have gone for you know, the low end musicals that, that, that haven't been done in this country. I mean, title show is, is a slight exception. So that's actually a delightful show. And, and, and that's a really great title that they did as well. So um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not down on the, on the shows they've chosen uh, entirely, but, but you know, 
I don't need to see I Love You, You're Perfect Now change ever again. But if, you, if you're going to put Simon Lipkin in it, um, uh, then I will go and see it. Here I go once more Fishing for another lover Shouldn't I confess a sordid fling Shouldn't I caress a cute young thing I love you, I love you, you're perfect I love you, you're perfect now I just, every time I see the words, you know, but every time Lambert Jackson announced a brand new musical they're doing online, I get excited because they're quite consistent. You know, I think all, I've loved every single one and it's something that I do look forward to. They've, you know, if there's ever a day where there's something that disappoints me of them, I think it's because the standard is so high. But I'm looking forward to seeing what comes next. And obviously they've done songs for New World on the stage. I would be interested if they brought Brooklyn to the stage as well, as for me, Brooklyn was their finest one they've done so far. But, set, but what we've talked about, Will it will it translate on the stage or will it suffer, like you said? And yeah, I think the complete opposite. I also saw it in Greenwich and thought it was terrible. And I didn't think this particularly solved any of its problems. I thought the problems were highlighted by some of the choices that they made, particularly in the thin characterization. Um, the use of the suicide storyline and the PTSD storyline were, were just magnified by this approach. And while it was beautiful and it was performed brilliantly, I, I still don't think it's a very good musical. And it was marginally better than the Greenwich one, but not substantially. And you did say in your review on the Review Hub that no one has produced this, this side of the Atlantic in 18 years and before it came to Greenwich. So, and that was telling. Like there was a reason why it's it taken that long to, to reach us? Uh, uh, not necessarily, Phil. I mean, Nick, Nick's Normal hasn't come here yet either. That's been 10 years. Mm. Um, great shows don't travel sometimes for other reasons. It's yeah. not necessarily because they're bad shows. Right. Although this yeah. one was. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but staying within that, because obviously Lambert and Jackson, without fault, have been pioneers as producers this year. But is that because they've kind of hit this niche and will they be able to kind of carry on that success and that momentum when it does come back to live theatre will their shows translate do we think Miriam what do you think well I saw songs from New World at the Palladium when it was staged in October and I thought it was excellent and I really enjoyed it but you know with social distancing it's it's very different than staging a full-scale musical I think I'd be interested to see what they do on stage with all of the paraphernalia that's that's possible, and I don't think we've seen that yet. Yeah, it should be said, by the way, that Southwark's um, uh, um, last five years and Lambert Jackson's um, five yeah. years, last five years yeah. were different shows. Um, they they uh, they did uh, Lambert Jackson did an online version of last five years, um, which which was nothing to do with the Southwark one. It was a, it was different cast. It was Danny Becker and Lauren Samuels. The Southwark Playhouse one was uh, a really fantastic cast: Molly Lynch and Ollie Higginson. Um, I mean. So, so they're very different. They're different pieces. They're, they're, they're not. They're, they're not. I mean, they're the same musical, but it's a different production. Completely and the, different the, the Katie Lipson one was from. It was paused. It was at the Suffolk Playhouse before the pandemic, and then filmed after the pandemic started. Where it, it did two runs. It got shut down twice due yeah. to it. I was lucky. I went both times, both runs. I loved the last five years, um, but I, I saw it with Samantha Barks a few years ago, which is incredible but yeah, I yeah. would say that this, Jonathan the Southern Playhouse production is the definitive version of it for me I just thought what they did with that show was absolutely incredible and like I said the Lam Lambert Jackson one was absolutely brilliant but for me the, Su the Southern Playhouse one was so brilliant my only criticism of that was the filmed production of it the film version I felt really didn't take the mag really just lost the magic of it a little bit it was I don't I think just choices it was like you know you'd get these moments which you would see in the theatre and they kind of cut away from it and I was like oh that's not the, not, that's not great but it's a great show but that was one that you need to be in person I think for 
And did you say, Mark, that you watched the title of show, the Lambert Jackson production? No, I didn't see that. I, just, I, I, I know the show because I saw the Broadway yeah. original. Uh, I saw it on Broadway. Actually, I saw it off Broadway first and I saw it transfer to Broadway. Um, but um, yeah, it's a fantastic little musical that... Yeah. Um, it's an awful, I mean, it's a, it's a, it shouldn't have transferred to Broadway. It's a big flop when it went to Broadway because like all these shows, uh, the, I mean, the only one of the Lambert Jackson shows that has actually had a Broadway run is title show, but that was a transfer from off Broadway uh, and Brooklyn. Um, but actually most of these are off Broadway shows, not Broadway shows. So um, yeah, they're, they're, they're small in scale deliberately. But having said that, you know, Lambert Jackson haven't just arrived in the pandemic. They were around as producers yeah, since before. 2018. They're young producers. The young producers who you know have who have ambition, um, and you know, I think they will well could well become a force to be reckoned with in years to come. Well, that's it because obviously they started out at Cadogan Hall doing concerts, and then they obviously they expanded and went to the other palace, and they had a very successful series of favourites. Um, and then obviously they were very quick off the mark. I think they they must have put Leave a Light on together before it was even announced that we were going into lockdown because it suddenly came out of nowhere and was an incredibly successful series. They had over 70 performers stripped across the entire series. And you can see the evolution as a company. Like I said, with title of show in particular, it was very kind of basic. It was set in the rehearsal room of the Coliseum and was quite simple. And what they did with Brooklyn has really upped their game. They've kind of like I say, it's a progression as producers that they're really kind of developing. And I think it shows. I was going, you wouldn't say, think it would be within one year of each other. If I was to put you last five years in Brooklyn next to each other, yeah. love them both. would you say that was less than one year between both of them? That The progression they've made in such a, a small time is incredible. Yeah. And you also look at what, what Curve Leicester did with, with, uh, with their lockdown musicals, because obviously they did them, they, they were supposed to be concert musicals of shows they'd done before. So they did, uh, obviously, the most recently, The Colour Purple, um, but before that, Sunset Boulevard. And when they did the Sunset Boulevard, con when the concert, the live concert had to be cancelled and they had the opportunity to just reconceive it as a film, th th they made it into a very strange hybrid of, of film and theatre. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, I thought it was a disaster. I thought it really didn't work um, um, because it was neither film nor theatre. It was just a, a kind of no man's land in between. Um, uh, it was with very odd photography, um, you know, just, just weird. I mean, like Norma Desmond staggering down the stairs of the dress circle, um, uh, uh, rather, you know, what, what, but why? What was the point? Um, the orchestra playing in, 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 the, in, in, in the stalls. Let me take you back six months. I was at the bottom of the barrel. Sons had Boulevard frenzied. Boulevard swamped with every kind of false emotion. At this time, we'll be bigger and brighter than we knew it. So watch me fly. All sorts of weird things in that one, I thought. Um, whereas, of course, Color Purple was, was much straighter. It was, a, it was just a concert. They didn't have as much time to put it together. Um, and it was beautiful. I thought yeah. the opposite about the Sunset Boulevard, actually. I thought because it came from a film, I thought they used the reference point of the original movie and the silent movie idea really well. So having the orchestra in the stalls where they would have been originally in a silent movie theatre playing for the cast was fascinating. And using the balcony to, to stage Norma Desmond's own balcony scenes was really, really interesting and gave depth to it. I, I agree. I mean, for me, as well as Lambert Jackson, the Curve Sunset Boulevard last year was 
my highlight of the year uh, online theatre wise Sunset Boulevard is my favourite Andrew Lloyd Webber you know sort of Glenn Close at the Coliseum so how do you compare that but I thought they did an incredible job the use of space you know there was something you know we've seen Glenn Close descend from the staircase on the stage at a massive Coliseum is incredible but then the way they've got Rhea Jones descending into the circle I thought that was an inspired touch the use of space I did, it was something that for me it was thinking that thinking outside the box is what's kept theatre alive this last 12 months and so <laughs> I only, really I, I adored it and it was only ever her space just her and Max no, no other characters ever appeared in the balcony that was really really interesting and I have to say, um, to give, give this production some credit, um, is that uh, Rhea Jones was a significant improvement on Glenn Close, who couldn't sing the part at all. I mean, the woman should never have been cast. There's no reason on earth that you cast a person who can't sing in a lead musical role. Well, uh, let's talk about waitress then. <laughs> uh, well, Kat, which was Kat McPhee? Oh, no, I meant Ashley Roberts. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, so I was going to have a little, a little diatribe about Kat McPhee, who I adore, Best. adored in the show, which was brilliant. And then I discovered she was a Trump voter. Yeah. And I thought, that's it, I'm no. done. No, I, I, again, I was, I was a massive Smash fan. So I know we're going way off topic, Bill, sorry. But Kat McPhee, you know, I was so excited. I went to New York, missed her and waitress by a week, was gutted. Then she was announced for London. I was so excited. So, so blown away by her. I actually did prefer her to Lucy Jones, which I will probably get lynched for saying. But then, and so, but then she became a Trump supporter and I was like, I won't support you anymore. Good, good anyway. on you. <laughs> so back to Brooklyn. Sorry. <laughs> I want to discuss the star ratings because I think Miriam, you can probably give me some insight into this because you're governed by, especially for the reviews hub, you have a criteria that you have to, to stick to. Has that criteria been adapted for online shows or are they still subject to the same criteria? It's exactly the same. And our, our criteria has been published. It's been published since the reviews of the GAN in 2009. So anyone can see what our rating is and, and it applies to all of the media that we support. So it's theatre, dance, arts, books, films. It's, it's all consistent. Wow. So Mark, because obviously you now review for your own publications and you still... So you're not necessarily governed by that protocol, but have you personally adapted your... I, I'm not doing star ratings at the moment um, yeah. uh, as a personal choice, because I think, I think short, it's a long, long tortured subject, the star rating subject, because um, of course, as a marketing tool, the papers want the, the productions want star ratings. They do want yeah. them because they can put them on posters and, and sell their shows. Um, unfortunately, we have a terrible thing called star inflation as a result. So uh, what, what happens is that, that, which is why it's really admirable that reviews have, have, have a criteria for this, because what happens is that people just give stars willy-nilly in order to get their name on the poster. Um, and, you know, you go to Edinburgh, even the, the, the worst shows have got five stars on, 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 from somebody. I mean, it's interesting uh, when you sent over the list of all the, the people who've reviewed uh, the show, Brooklyn. Um, I think there are, uh, hold on, let me see. Five or five star and a two star from the Times. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so that, that, now, of course, I'm not going to say that the Times has a, a more authoritative voice than anybody else. But, but the Times um, and, let's see, the stage, obviously, Broadway World, um, London Theatre One, um, uh, at Reviews Hub, maybe six people. I mean, I obviously I've heard of all that, all that dazzles because I follow you on Twitter, uh, Daz. But um, actually, most of those sites I've not even heard of. So that's the point: is that you get, you get, you get a, a range of, you get eighteen reviews. You said, well, of which ten maybe I've never even heard of. Why am I going to put any authority in 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 their star rating on a on a poster? What what what? It means meaningless. If the Guardian or Times or Telegraph, and I'm, I get it that 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 you know we're living in a in a different universe now than we used to, but there's no equivalence. There isn't an equivalence. The the, the Times critic, he, he's employed to, to by a newspaper, uh, an editor, to, to to do that. The 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 ten other people who I've never heard of, they're not employed by anybody. Yeah, they, they, they've self-appointed themselves to be critics. They therefore 
I'm not saying that they're worse critics, but some of them, frankly, the, the Times used to have, a uh, before Clive Davis was actually really good now, they had a critic called Anne Treneman, who was the worst critic in Great Britain, absolutely the worst critic in Great Britain. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so just because you're employed by a newspaper doesn't make you a good critic. But I just think that there's, an, there's a sense of authority that's lacking sometimes in this great glut of, of opinion that's out there. I mean, I'm perhaps guilty of being very generous with my star ratings and reviews. For me, with the website, All It Dazzles, I want to be positive. You know, I want to really shine a positive light on theatre, especially in such a dark time. Now, for me, I've already thought about when theatres do reopen and we go back to normal, am I going to be a bit harsher with my reviews? But at the moment, what I try and do is look for the good. So there are certain shows where there's stuff I don't like. I see the imperfections. I think, what have they done? What, you know, what have they overcome to actually produce this? And I look for the good. Sometimes there isn't much good. And, you know, there is a review, re a review recently I just didn't do because I could not think of anything good to say about it. Oh. But, um, you know, I try and find it, you know, and something like Brooklyn, I was, you know, really blown away. That wasn't an inflated score, definitely. I was like, oh, that is so five stars. And I love uh, how subjective theatre is. That is the true beauty of it. But I actually thought every, it would get universally like five stars. Same with Curve Sunset Boulevard. I thought if I've ever have seen a five star piece of online theatre, it's that. But it's really interesting that some people dislike it, like yourself, Mark. Um, but again, that's that's the beauty. You know, how boring would it be if, every, if you know, a thousand people came out of theatre and every single one was like, loved it, loved it, loved it. You know, and that's, again, one of the reasons I started the website was to actually have these conversations because I was a bit bored of like, you know, my partner just not giving any feedback on shows. You know, I want to have that conversation. I want someone to say, hated it. Why did you hate it? You know, this is why I loved it and have that healthy debate. Well, that's it. I mean, I remember being sat with you, Mark. You kindly took me to see, I think it was Hand to God. Oh, oh my God, that terrible, terrible, that terrible. terrible. You gave it one star, but I loved it. I was sat there giggling away all the way through it, and then you gave it one star. So, I mean, it does show that, like, opinions do differ, and that's fine. But Of course, and, and that's, there's, there's no right and wrong in criticism. No. There's no such thing. But, there, but, but there's no right and wrong, but there is more informed and less informed. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah. But then do we feel that, obviously, if you're going to award something five stars, is it diluting the system? this influx of reviews at that level? The system is screwed up anyway. I mean, because it's all it is is a marketing tool now. That's yeah. all it is. And and actually, you know, because, because a lot of the papers don't even have, you know, most shows of this level will not, if, lucky to get a Times review. Notice they didn't get a Guardian review. They didn't get a, you know, so, you know, there, there are so few outlets, um, you know, legitimate outlets of the, the, the old outlets of the past that theatre companies are reliant on the blog on, 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 on this world now so you know you'll go to a press night and you know that, that probably uh, 90 percent 95 percent of the reviewers will be bloggers and I'm interested Miriam do you because obviously you your you have your own blog and then reviews her and do you measure your own blog to the same standard that you do when you review for the reviews hub? Uh, well, I don't use star ratings on my blog either uh, because it's long form criticism and it's it's just quite a different approach. But yeah, I, I approach everything fairly consistently. So if I think something is three star in on my blog, I will write about it as though it were a three, a three star show and explain why I thought what well, I would justify that I would explain why yeah that that's the case but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think about it differently I don't go into a show that I'm watching for my blog with a different mindset to one that I'm watching for the reviews hub so talking about the, the positives of, of of Brooklyn and there were many positives I mean we've got to speak about the cast because I think we can collectively agree that they were an incredible cast um yeah Hands down, I mean, real luxury casting, luxury casting to have to have the likes of of you know Emma Kingston, um, uh, Jamie Moscato. I mean, phenomenal people that, that are phenomenal no matter where where you know what show they're in. But and of course, in some ways, luxury casting undermines the show a bit because they're better than the material, um, and yeah. it just kind of shows that the material is so weak uh, ultimately. Um, but you know, but but having said that, the the the, the, the show does does deliver because. Basically, it's just it's just X Factor singing. Basically, is what is what it, is what it's designed to, to provoke. Um, and you know, Emma Kingston can deliver you a bit of X Factor, um, but she's she's a star. 
Um, yeah. And so can Jamie Moscato. I genuinely, I did not know of Emma Kingston before, well, before this uh, pandemic, you know, so I think this is one of the beauty of online theatre. It's making me discover performers that I didn't know and don't know how I missed that. But Emma Kingston is someone that wasn't on my radar. And now I'm like, if I see her name on, on the show, I'm like, I want to see her in that. Because in this, you know, for me, you've got people like Marisha Wallace, who's such a powerhouse, and to hold your own in that performance when they're together, it's like, God, that was like diva off. It was phenomenal. So again, this is one of the positives of online theatre, that these names I've discovered, you know, there are people as well, like, you know, just um, who've just done all of these online shows that I might have seen in the show and maybe not paid attention to them because they weren't the, the lead, or, you know, they, they didn't have enough to do on the stage for me to pay attention to, but... I'm paying attention now, and these are people that I really look forward to seeing where their careers go. I have to say, I didn't, I'd never seen Newton Matthews before, never heard of him before. Mm, um, yeah, um, he, and, and, and I'm a incredible really performer. And, and when I, 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 he reminded me of Sammy Davis Jr., I thought he was phenomenal. Um, so, you know, he's, yeah, exactly, you can discover new performers. Although I have to say that one of the things that I've noticed about online, th online theatre is it's pretty much the same crowd who get the jobs in online yeah. theatre. Uh, they, 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 there's not an awful lot of new talent being brought in. Uh, because again, they need, for commercial reasons, they need the performer who has 30 or 40 or 50 or 60,000 Twitter followers, or better yet, you know, 150,000 Twitter followers. Um, so, uh, you know, look at look at Dead Drop the Play, which I'm, you know, I haven't seen uh, in the, at the Garrick. They're just putting in these two drag queens from um, uh, RuPaul. from RuPaul. Um, and I looked, I looked, look, I never heard of them. I looked them up the other day, um, and one of them's got 350,000 followers, the other one's got 250,000 followers. Well, of course they've been cast in this. Because that's that that's that's the that's the engine to drive the ticket sales. And if we look at that specifically with Lambert Jackson, so with Songs for a New World, they did try to combat that by obviously they had the four stars, but then they brought in a new grad to kind of <clears throat> as their fifth performer. So is that a way to combat this kind of because you are right, and we all understand why it is the way it is, but is that a yeah. way to to resolve it or to at least kind of balance it out? Funny, the, the, guy, the new grad you mentioned in the Songs for New World at the Palladium, because I teach at Arts Ed, and in fact, he's yeah. one of my kids. I taught him at Arts Ed um, as well. I mean, it's been wonderful to watch these people come through, to have uh, Miriam Teak Lee, who's now got an Olivier Award for her name, yeah. I taught her in her first year. I mean, it's phenomenal. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, I, I had seen him, but nobody else had seen him because, uh, you know, he was unknown at that point. So that is one way to give new opportunities. But otherwise, you know, Rachel Tucker is going to be in everything because, you know, why not? She's absolutely brilliant. You want to cast Rachel Tucker in everything. Well, that's it. I mean, it's, it's no irony that their Lambert Jackson started with a series called Favourites because they clearly do have their favourites. But then, as you've just said, they, those favourites are fan favourites and if they're going to pull people in. And this is an interesting thing about all the online content. We can't really measure how successful they are because it's not like they've got a sign outside the building saying full house. We can't tell how well these shows are doing. Have you thought about that? I mean, sometimes, you know, when they, when they, they say extended due to popular demand and they say, because, you know, we've got these reviews and because, because, more people want to see it. That's the only kind of gauge. You've got some ones like Hope Mill when they did Rent where their performances were sold out because they yeah. had, which I still don't understand these rules about how many tickets they can sell if they're a real venue, which still perplexes me. But with the Hope Mill, is. I do understand Hope Mill because they were contracted to a certain amount of productions. So they had to mm -hmm. honour their original contract and they could only sell as many tickets as they were originally contracted to under <laughs> the licensing. Um, mm -hmm. However, I don't know how, I mean, obviously they're bringing it back this year. Um, I don't know whether they're going to do an online stream again or whether it'll just be a live venue. But that was the restriction with that show in particular. But obviously these new shows are kind of, they can be unrestricted depending on how good your agent is at getting a contract. Uh, all these shows, most of them, sorry, not all of them, most of them seem to come on stream theatre at the moment. And I think what we, I bet they go for a limited time. They're there for a week and then they go. What I would like to see is, you know, when theatres are back, let's have a website like Broadway HD, which which keeps all of these shows, documents them, and then people can like maybe pay a subscription or pay for them one by one and just watch them, have them there. Let's not have these shows disappear because even if online theatre doesn't continue, which I do hope it does, you know, it would be a shame to just disregard this last year as 
some publications are doing by saying that there has been no theatre at all when it's been, you know, I think Mary was saying before, the most exciting time for theatre, you know, all the, the creative ways that people have kept it alive. I would love to keep that somewhere, in, you know, to say that, oh, this was 2020, you know, all these productions that happened when we couldn't go to the theatre, you know, something for the grandkids to say, look, when theatres weren't around, this is what happened. Yeah, certainly, like I say, with Sunset Boulevard, it was very testament to the pandemic. It, it had so many nods within that show that made it kind of a unique production in its own right. Um, but like I say, I'm sure it, it won't compare to, to an actual sta- stage show. So I kind of disagree. I, I don't think, I, I mean, it's an interesting point. It's like kind of have this, should we have this Netflix system where you could just watch anything on demand forever and eternity? Or will that, as Mark said earlier, will that actually put people off coming back to theatre? And do we need to preserve live theatre by aiming to get back into the venues? I mean, I watched last night, I watched a film production of Billy Elliot and I never saw it in the theatre. It was here for, what, 11 years? And I never saw it. I even worked 30 seconds away from the theatre and walked past it every day. Never saw it. Just, I was a bit of a snob, maybe thought I won't like it. Watched it. I mean, I watched it a couple of months ago for the first time and then watched it again last night. And I sat here so moved, so overwhelmed, you know, sobbing at parts. And I, I would absolutely loved it. And I thought this is probably one of my favourite musicals ever. And then I thought, why did I never see it? Because as incredible as it was watching it, and it was still, you know, a, a five star production watching it like that. What would it have been like in the theatre? You know, experiencing things like the letter in the theatre, you know, and that's what I miss. You know, it's moments at shows I've had where I've been crying and someone's handed me a tissue. You know, everybody's talking about Jamie once. Someone actually hugged me because I'd bonded with her in the interval about how I relate to the story. You know, you it's the connection, I guess. I think that's probably the biggest thing. Even if you get eye contact on the stage or you see that they're crying on the stage, they're really moved by it or a last performance and you can see what's the different nuances about it. That's, I think, what you, what you can't recreate with online. What did we think of the musical arrangement of Brooklyn? Because obviously they were up against the fact that they were filming in a pandemic and they couldn't have... I, I think that was down to the reason why they only had a small band. Um, did it work? I think Ray Rackham for British Theatre criticised the fact that it, it kind of dated the piece by restricting it to the, to the three instruments. What were your thoughts, Mark? I... I... I thought it was a terrific little band, very tight, um, tight sound. It, it sounded bigger than it was, uh, but than, than the small size of it. I liked the way it interacted. They interacted with the the action, so you know we, they were visible throughout the show. Um, uh, you know, it's nice when musicians are included in that way. Um, but no, I mean, I would. It wasn't. I mean, unlike say Songs for a New World, which which is has one of the most incredible orchestrations because orchestration Rob Brown is an incredible pianist in his own right and makes life really difficult for anybody who else has to play that material. Um, but uh, the Songs for New World, you know, was in a league of its own because Jason, Jason writes his own orchestration and he's, he's an amazing uh, composer uh, in every way. Um, so that was that was exceptional. But, you know, these songs aren't that great, so it doesn't, it doesn't actually um, um, lend itself to uh, too, too big a sound. I yeah. think it's the, um, the nature of the city weeds. It's supposed to be this small group of people creating something together. So if you have too big an orchestra, actually that undermines that part of the story. Yeah. And it was interesting to see, I mean, let's dissect it. Like what is it about that show that just doesn't work? Because I think for me, it peaks at that song that we all know once upon a time. And it's the belter, it's the the song that stands out from the show. And it's very early in the show. So it kind of hits that mark. And then for me, it just teeters off. And it's, I mean, and it's a complex story. It's a very, very unusual story. What do you think it is, Miriam, that just didn't connect? I think it's it's all too insubstantial. There are too many uh, circumstances, too many coincidences none of the characters have any depth or or quality to them really you, you just sort of surface of, of everything all of the time and so when you've got these characters who are supposed to be going through these incredible traumas and have this 
terrible childhood that this girl, this girl has been orphaned because her mother committed suicide and her mother's just having this lovely cheery song about about death and watching over her it, it just felt really thin yeah nothing nothing is earned no emotion is earned really basically the, the emotions are all in the you know in, in the power balance um, and they're, they're not earned I think it's unfair to say it's a one song show though so, I mean yeah once upon a time is stunning but then Marisha's big song Raven I thought was equally yeah. incredible and then uh, Brooklyn and Blood as well I mean there were several songs in there which I was like I would not object to this cast recording, you know, being on my Spotify, you know, this, and I haven't gone back and listened to other versions of Brooklyn yet, but I would kind of, I would like that version really to listen to, especially Emma Kingston's Once Upon a Time, Marisha's Raven. Exactly. And we've got to commend Emma as well for accompanying herself. I think that was a beautiful touch. Uh, yeah. And Jamie. Jamie also played his own piano, uh, piano yeah. guitar. Jamie was Gato's voice day. Every time I see him in a show, I've always been surprised. It's like, you forget how good he is. Like, first time I saw him was Big Fish, and I was like, oh my God, his voice. And then like a year later in Heather's, I was like, oh, it's him again. Oh, that, I forgot that voice. And again, because I haven't seen him on stage in a little while, that voice again, it's like, oh, the tone of it is just gorgeous. Tell me what I have to go and do to make you change your mind. Anything I have to promise to, I'll gladly get behind. I'm the man who you should marry, you intended. about the same people being cast he's not really done much during the during all this mm. uh, online theatre so it was refreshing to see him same with marisha you haven't really seen her on online product an, an online production like this so i, I love the cast i think about marisha because she was busy this year filming uh channel four well i think it was a sitcom with lisa kudrow and you could see the flourishes in this show which i think really resonated like she she's a brilliant actress as well as a powerhouse vocalist I think some of the scenes, especially given what they were working with, which was a very, very laboured script, um, she did a really, really good job of like bringing it, bringing it out. I thought I was really impressed. I guess it's proof that you can get, you know, the most talented people like this cast can, you know, do wonders, do magic with even the poorest of shows. And like I say, I have not seen this before. I can't compare it to anything. But all I can say is I loved this show. And the cast were a big factor in it and the choices that, you know, even stuff like the set design, that exploding piano was genius. It was gorgeous mm. to watch. Yeah, we haven't talked about the, the set design because it was stunning. The building itself was a find. I don't know how they found it, but it just really did lend itself. You said, I think, Mark, particularly about the, the red pillars. The pillars. Yeah, the, 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 those red pillars were reminded of, of straight out of a New York subway um, uh, uh, station. Um, what's kind of extraordinary, it had a very, you know, kind of New york -y feel about it. And yet, and here's the amazing thing is, that I gather it was filmed uh, in Bermondsey, uh, in a venue in Tanner Street in Bermondsey, which is maybe five minutes away from where I'm sitting right yeah. now, down the road. Um, I've, I've never heard of it. Um, yeah, it got my doorstep and I never heard of it. Exactly. You could have popped down and had, had a look. <laughs> yeah, but yeah it was visually it was a feast it was beautiful like I say it, I think it helped take us to these different worlds especially the the transitions between costumes were were enabled by this filming of it which and that, that's a lot a lot of that's down to Gene Johnson the, the director who I thought did a really smart job of of uh, bringing those worlds together um uh, so yeah Good, good, good work. Good work realizing a not great show. Yeah, and I think he also filmed it himself. If I'm right, mm -hmm. he did the sim, which is again like this is the thing I think we we have to all commend. Like these are stage performers who are adapting to perhaps think uh, again like mm -hmm. directors and picking up a camera and having a go. And yeah, there were bits where that was slightly out of focus. It wasn't expertly shot, but it lent that to this production, I felt. And like I say, it really does, it shows how these performers are adapting and evolving 
and if anything, just in, improving. I mean, like one thing I could say, like, you know, when I've been like to every time I do a new episode of the Theatre Channel, I'm always like, on a call with uh, Bill Deemer and uh, Adam Blanchard, who does the, who does it. And we talk to the performers about it and how difficult they found staring down a lens because like you said they've not been used to it they need that audience connection that's what that's how they know you know that people are responding they look at the audience and they're performing to a camera and they don't know what's going on even like marisha wallace when she did uh, i think it was somewhere she did on the, the last episode of it and she was saying that she needs you know she she had actually people gathered around there because when marisha's singing you're going to pay attention but to go into the camera it's something unusual to get used to because Again, these, these performers, if they've just been on stage, they're not used to it. So it's like that they are changing, but you've got to change, especially at the moment, this ever uncertain world. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, well, I should uh, wrap up there, unless anybody else has got anything they want to say about the Brooklyn. I think we've said it all. I think we've said <laughs> it all. <laughs> would said you it watch all. it again? Well, obviously, this is the thing. Daz, would you watch it again? Yeah. Definitely. Uh, there's a few online productions that like Brooklyn, Sunset Boulevard, I would happily watch again. I would treat it like something like Billy Elliot Live, you know, a filmed production. And if, you know, they were available, they weren't these one and done things. I, you know, I'd have it, on, I'm an old fashioned, have it on DVD. I'd watch it, you know, I'd, but yeah, definitely with Brooklyn. I think I've seen it, seen it once, that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Miriam, any final thoughts? I've seen it twice. Uh, I'd rather not see it again, but that's our job. We get a sense of these things. If someone revives it, we might go. <laughs> I'll let you know after the second time I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, go away and have a look again. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you all so, so much. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. Thank you. Lovely to talk to you all. Thanks for Amazing. See you later. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.